So hello everyone, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Giovanni Valentini and I'm the Associate Program Chair of the Knowledge and Innovation Interest Group. And my role here is mostly to provide you with a little bit of background for this session. So uh, the foundation's interview is by now a tradition of our interest group was introduced uh, nine years ago by Gabriel Zulanski as an opportunity on the one hand to honor those scholars who are literally at the foundations of what we study. And on the other hand, as an opportunity to get to know a little bit more about their path and most importantly, perhaps about what's next in our field. So, and today it is our privilege and pleasure to have here with us Anita McGann. Anita is university professor at the University of Toronto and professor at the Manx School of Global Affairs and Public Policy and professor of strategic management at the Rotman School of Management. And we will hear more about her in a minute, but I would like to briefly stress two things about Anita. So the first one, is, which I would say is a fact, is that she could be a foundation scholar of several interest groups at the SMS because her work has spawned a number of domains with interest. And the second and perhaps most important thing is that uh, over the years, not only has she produced and developed new, innovative and relevant knowledge, but she has inspired many young scholars to do so. And not just with her work, but also with her example and generosity. And so I would like to thank again very much Anita for being here with us today. And now I'll leave the floor to uh, following the tradition to the two PhD students who are actually conducting the interview, Giacomo and Kangi. And thank you for all the hard work you've put into analyzing uh, Anita's career path. And thank you to Anita for being here with us. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you. Uh, I will uh, share my screen. We prepare uh, a very small introduction for this conversation. So first of all, thank you. Anita for this wonderful opportunity of having this conversation. And we already talked a little bit during the preparation for this interview and it's already been so stimulating that we we'll really look forward to engage with you and with the audience in this hour together today. So we try to, uh, to compress your profile in a slide. It has been not an easy task uh, to give a sense of what has been your contribution in, uh, in our field up to today. Uh, so as Giovanni said, I mean, besides of being a professor in Rockman School of Management, she, Anita is also co-appointed at the Mount School of Global Affairs and Public Policy in Toronto. She's cross-appointed at the Medical School of Dalalana School of Public Health. She's a senior associate in the Institute of Strategy and Competitiveness at Harvard, and she's also chief economist at the Division of Global Health and Innovation in Massachusetts General Hospitals. And this gives already a sense of the scope of Anita's research and teaching efforts. She published more than 150 research articles. She has already now more than 11,000 citations out there. And, and we are going to walk you through a little bit now uh, what we try to to do is a sort of overview of your research activities during these last 30 years. And this is at best our result. It's, it's been challenging because as Giovanni was saying, you span many different uh, domains. And here is just a selection of what we thought the most, what has been the most influential of your work, just to give an idea of um, in how many different domains you gave an important contribution to our field, uh, starting from uh, your interest in industry change and evolution, uh, and, and then moving to the, uh, the research in terms of performance, uh, such as the seminal paper with Michael Porter in 1997, and, uh, and then moving to our, an interest in more sustainable growth and sustainable performance of firms. You're also being known for interest in entrepreneurship and establishment of new fields, and and, and beside all of that, like or now 10, 15 years ago, you started these uh, research activities in what uh, we can call the global, global grand challenges of our society. Um, you've been so prolific in this field and we're gonna talk about here because one of the main uh, domain that you address is the global health. And for sure is today's one of the most um, interesting and uh, urgent issue that we can, that we can discuss about. 
So just to have a brief overview of, to, of agenda today, so we're going to start um, talking a little bit about uh, Anita, her career, her personal perspective on her career and the evolution of her research. Then we're going to have a conversation of these grand challenges for our time for strategy and innovation scholars. Then moving into some more details uh, on uh, what is the most uh, urgent issue nowadays, the COVID-19 aftermath, what went wrong in the health system, what, what can we do now about it? And finally, uh, what's next? How can companies tackle the societal problems and what are the future, future direction of strategy innovation research? We're gonna close our hour with a Q&A section. So please feel free to use the chat of Zoom to, um, uh, to already provide uh, us some of the questions the audience, you audience can have for, for Anita. And uh, we, um, we're gonna try to read them all um, based on the time. I mean, the first comes, the first will be read. Uh, so thank you again. And then I will leave the floor to Kangi for kicking on with this about Anita Korean evolution of research. Okay. Hey, thank you, Giovanni and Giacomo, and thanks for having me here. Uh, I'm Kang Yi Liu, a second year PhD at INSEAD. And uh, to emphasize again for all the online audiences today, welcome. And uh, you guys are very important for our session as well. And remember to write your questions here in the chat box and we will read them at the end of our interview. So firstly, uh, let's move to Professor Anita, your career. And looking at your curriculum, we can see that uh, before entering academia, you have been working in companies such as um, Morgan, Morgan Stanley, McKinsey, so well known and popular. Um, and after being both in consultancy and investment banking, why did you choose academia and uh, how did your professional experience influence your PhD life? First of all, thank you so much for inviting me here today, and uh, thanks to everyone who's joined. As I look at the list of participants, I'm incredibly humbled. Uh, 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 you know, all of you, it seems to me, uh, should be sitting in this chair. So it's really, it's really amazing to have you here and, and to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, these experiences. And Giovanni, uh, uh, Jacquemo, I hope I'm saying that right, Jacquemo and uh, Kangi, thank you so much yeah. for uh, all the work that you put into this. So uh, when I was an undergrad at Northwestern University, I had a wonderful mentor, Jane Mansbridge, and uh, I can't help but to smile as I remember uh, Joe Mahoney introducing me, I think, for the Irwin Award and putting a picture of Jenny Mansbridge up on a slide uh, to talk about this. And he, he really knows me so well, you know, and pointed to a particular experience that I had as an undergrad, which was I had an amazing mentor. Jenny has recently been the president of the American Political Science Association, and she advised me uh, upon graduation from my undergrad uh, to go get some business experience. I was, at that time, I was president of my college. I was, I was working full time while I was going through school to try to raise the money for my tuition and uh, expenses and so on. And, um, you know, I, I was very uh, interested in political science. I, I, made, I ended up majoring in an interdisciplinary major uh, and, and she encouraged me to get some business experience. So I, I had applied to business schools um, uh, uh, at her advice as well, instead of going into a PhD program in political science, I applied to business schools on her advice. And I went to, um, I went to uh, Prury first as a mathematician and then quickly moved over to Morgan Stanley after just a short time uh, when I was offered a job at Morgan Stanley in New York, my hometown, and then went to Harvard Business School on plan. Once I was at Harvard Business School, I had an amazing mentor in, uh, in uh, John MacArthur, the Dean of uh, Harvard Business School. And he reached out to me, I think in particular, because I was one of the first women uh, who was going through the MBA program and was um, having some, was enjoying it and having some real, um, I don't know, uh, I, I was doing well in the program. So he, he uh, reached out to me. And then uh, once I graduated and went to McKinsey, which was really, um, uh, as part of an effort to return to New York, I, I, I went to McKinsey and set it back into investment banking because I wanted I wanted to work on strategy. I wanted to work on big important problems and help achieve impact of companies. And uh, one of my clients became John MacArthur, who asked for me to be assigned to a study uh, examining the strategy of Harvard Business School to um, basically broaden its 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 agenda to be more research oriented. That led me to meet Dick Caves, who became my supervisor in my PhD program. And uh, 
So I'd say the core theme for me was mentors, having amazing mentors, Jenny Mansbridge, John MacArthur, and Dick Caves, all of whom really cared about me and did everything they could to clear the way for me to be successful and to return to really what was my original uh, interest, was, which was uh, to, to get a doctorate and pursue an academic career. Okay. Thank you. And uh, moving to our next question, um, <laughs> we as PhD students, we would like to know a bit about your perspective regarding doctoral programs. And uh, we see, according to your CV again, you have been running the PhD program at Rothman for five years. And uh, from your experience, what did you see in the most successful PhD candidates? And uh, we know <laughs> like, Last year, you have a talk titled Being Happy as a PhD. So for those of us you know, who missed it, what a pity. So what was it about? And could you please share a bit about this? Sure. I mean, I, I can't help but to notice that that Leo, my doctoral student, is on the call. And, you know, I, I, I wonder if the advice that I'm about to give would resonate with him. Leo, uh, please keep me honest here. But... It, 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 but the, you know, what I was, what I was saying in that talk and, and what has been true, you know, in my experience as the director of the PhD program at Rotman is that the typical advice given to Rot doctoral students is to publish as quickly as possible, contribute to theory, you know, figure out your audience, network, meet people, don't teach too much, don't do too much reviewing, you know, go to conferences and make friends, but we're, above all, worry constantly about tenure. You know, that is sort of the ethos that I think emerges or at least emerged in many a doctoral consortia of which I was involved over the years. And the problem with that is it's, it's too oriented toward managing the more challenging or bads, bad sides of our profession. In other words, the more challenging sides of our profession. In order to be happy as a doctoral student, I think you have to balance all of that advice against pursuing the, the goods or the positive sides of what makes being a PhD student and an academic rewarding. You know, most of us got into this profession because we wanna have impact, because we wanna be part of enduring institutions that uh, will outlast uh, short-term problems, because we wanna have uh, an impact on young people, we wanna teach, we wanna be part of, uh, you know, we want to be stewards of knowledge in society and we want to generate ideas, as President Obama used to say, ideas are the most important resource in society. How do we generate, you know, really important insights that can lead to value creation in a broad sense along the lines, for example, of the sustainable development goals. So I think for, for my advice to doctoral students, and it of course varies for each student, each each student will be different in terms of what their, their needs are. But I would say, you know, you've got to manage the downsides and, and, and you know, sort of, um, and, and tool up and, and, and be effective at managing the more challenging aspects of our career. You know, the experience, for example, of, of being, you know, in a sense, almost, almost uh, hazed by referees in some experiences manage those problems, those challenges, but at the same time, stay focused enough on what's important to you and drew you into this career. And, and to do that, I think you have to know something about the big picture, about what motivates you. So it could be climate, it could be pandemic remediation, it could be remediation of inequality, uh, poverty abatement, it could be a lot of different things. Knowing that big picture is very important. And then picking projects that are like pieces of the puzzle that allow you to understand just as you would if you were doing a jigsaw puzzle, critical pieces of information that will allow you to unlock broader answers. And, uh, you know, net, all the things that you are advised to do all the time, like network and so on, uh, should be aligned, should, shouldn't just be people, I mean, there's many people in the academy or wonderful people who you want as your friends for sure, but the, the real networking opportunity and the reviewing opportunities should be uh, with people that are also share your view of the big picture and are working on their pieces of the puzzle so that the sum of your efforts is greater than the parts. So really focusing on, you know, knowing what you're about and what your interests are in a broad sense, and then picking projects that not just are above the bar in terms of what you can, you know, achieve, but that are aligned with what you feel is important. You know, so that's that's the sum the summary there. 
Thank you, <laughs> Nita. <laughs> it really makes sense and very inspiring for us. Yeah, very helpful. I and see Leo uh, just put a note in the chat. Thank you, Leo. Um, <laughs> you know, Leo's passion is poverty abatement in Brazil, and not just in Brazil, but worldwide. And, you know, he's, he's, he's inspiring to me because he, that is his big picture agenda. And of course, our challenge and my challenge, my duty as his supervisor is going to be to try to train him to actually write papers that conform to our theoretical perspectives and, and our empirical terms and so on. So making that translation between the broad and then the specific is, um, you know, the work of being a PhD supervisor and PhD student. Excuse me for interrupting, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, yeah. And uh, we can move to our last question here in this topic. Um, we would like to know, how did you start crafting your first research ag agenda? And uh, what was the drivers behind the evolution of your research agenda? And maybe uh, at the last, you can share us a bit a uh, story uh, behind one of your most successful paper. Uh, I know so you have thank a lot you. of yeah, <laughs> well, thank you. It, um, so my my entry into the field, and I see that there's several friends on the on the who are participating in this in this um, on this enterprise. You know, Shawan, Enrique, Ricard, and so on. We're all about the same same age, you know, same timetable in terms of our uh, impact here. The field has really developed a lot since I was a PhD student. I got my PhD in 1990. Started that PhD program in 1988. Back then I was in an economics program and we were really sort of, um, uh, you know, looking at reduced form IO as the framework for trying to have impact. And, and you know, m my mentor, my PhD supervisor, Dick Caves, really encouraged me to write publishable papers and, and he really wanted me to accelerate my graduation. And it, mm -hmm. it was only really decades later, about 20 years after I graduated, that I yeah. really understood what he was trying to accomplish for me, which was he, he really did not believe that I was going to flourish in that program. And he wanted me out of it as quickly as possible. And there were reasons for that that I only came to really understand when Dick was ill uh, uh, much many years later. And I was uh, sitting with him as uh, in his home in Cambridge talking about what, what we went through then. Um, so my evolution as a scholar really um, has two main themes. One is a return to my native interest. There was a big, yeah. I, I hope Giacomo will send me that chart that you did, which was so generously constructed. <laughs> there was a big return for me when I uh, got tenure at, uh, in about 1999 at Boston University. I just was, uh, you know, when I was about 40 years old, I thought, I am going to work on what I'm really interested in. That is what tenure is for. That is my obligation in society. And I no longer tried to construct research um, research topics that I, that were conforming to what I thought the institution wanted of me. Even though I benefited from that and very was very grateful to work I did at, at HBS, especially with Mike Porter, um, who I just spoke with not too long ago. And he is um, a dear friend. And I'm very grateful for his friendship and, and collegi uh, collegiality. But... You know, I really uh, unlocked my own my own interests um, uh, over time and pursued my and followed my interests over time. Uh, that's one theme. The second is that I've always, and this goes back to my early um, experiences uh, under the tutelage of, of Jenny Mansbridge and and uh, and John MacArthur and and Dick. I've always been interested in practice and bridging uh, not just uh, relevant. Uh, relevant topics, but also um, outlets in my um, in my work. In, in other words, publications, uh, teaching cases, uh, practitioner articles, speaking engagements, board uh, uh, obligations that would take that work and bring it to practice and bring practical experiences back into academy. I have not been a scholar that's managed her citations. I have been a scholar that's written what I really organically written from the inside what I think is important. And that reflects really very early training from my parents on um, what it means to, to be a steward of knowledge in society. Okay, thank you. And uh, now let's uh, move to Giacomo, the set topic two. Yes, uh, so thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so you were saying, you were saying about the, the importance of having these big questions that motivates us 
in uh, uh, in finding our I mean our answer our small answer to 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 something something bigger and among these I mean some some which is very stimulating and important for sure is what has been called uh, as grand challenges for our society and you are known for a long-standing interest in this topic. So you have a statement in your website that we, we found uh, that was about this, and it was called Reshaping Business School to Focus on the Most Important Management Problems of Our Time. And it has been written uh, in 2010. So we wanted to talk about this now, but first sure. of all, which do you think are the most important innovation and management problems of our time? Are the same of 10 years ago? Did we solve any? <laughs> so, yeah, so back in 2009, 2010, I did a TEDx talk um, about how I thought business schools needed to be fundamentally transformed um, in the way that we, that we teach and we approach um, the, the, the mandate that our students give us um, by coming into our MBA programs. That TEDx talk then got published in an article in Rotman Magazine, and that led to uh, a number of different opportunities for me, uh, which in some ways were very surprising, including ultimately uh, election to be president of the academy, uh, in which I ran on a platform that business schools needed to change fundamentally. This was in 2013, I ran for election um, and, and didn't expect to win actually, uh, but wanted to get that message out, um, wanted to get that message out. So the grand challenges uh, broadly construed even back in 2010 and earlier, I mean, you know, earlier, I mean, I grew, I grew up in a very, strong um, tradition of kind of uh, kind of a, a liberal progressive New Yorker, you know, Irish Catholic, you know, background, you know, of, of, of wanting to tend to the poor, of wanting to deal with social problems, of sitting around with family all the time, talking about how the world was a mess and we needed to try to be part of the solution. Um, the grand challenges are, are very well summarized in the sustainable development goals, the 17 sustainable development goals from the United Nations. And they include things like climate impact, you know, remediating gender inequity, poverty alleviation, um, developing strong institutions, strong governance, strong partnerships. Um, economic growth is uh, SDG number eight, which is often trades off against uh, some of these other things. And I see trade offs between uh, some of these goals, for example, uh, Emmanuel uh, Macron uh, in instituting that 12 cent per liter tax in uh, France a few, you know, maybe, I think maybe two years ago or so, um, uh, in the interest of trying to fulfill uh, France's commitments to the Paris Accord for climate impact, uh, sparked the Yellow Vest movement, which was a, a very strong statement by uh, people who felt that they were on the uh, the, the shallow end of the economic spectrum uh, is thought that the tax was unjustly uh, penalizing the poor and, and creating these problems for people who are low income. So trade-offs between uh, the sustainable development goals are, are breaking those trade-offs are critical to the current agenda. What have I learned? I've learned that, and you know, a lot of the experiences, a lot of the ways in which I've learned uh, what I've learned about global challenges arose from the work that I did with Jerry George, both um, as a co-author, uh, as a co-author of a paper on inclusive growth, but also um, in our collaboration when I was academy president and he was the uh, editor of AMJ and, and, and pressing for more research on, on grand challenges. A lot of the, the sources of the grand challenges, I think, come from some of the same root causes. In other words, the, climate, the fact that we have a climate uh, uh, crisis right now, which Jerry Davis calls climate suicide, hu hu humanity pursuing a path of climate suicide, the fact that we have a climate crisis is not independent of the fact that we have the kind of economic inequality that was at the heart of the Yellow Vest movement. Uh, the fact that we have essential workers during the COVID crisis being paid so much less than um, I am sitting in my pristine little apartment behind a Zoom camera, completely protected from COVID. The fact that that inequity exists is not independent of, you know, the other problems that are in uh, the, the, so, uh, you know, just the other day in an SMS session, uh, Veed Hennish made, a, a, an incredible scholar uh, from Wharton made the argument that uh, Francis Stewart has, has, has shown or, or has effectively argued that all of these grand challenge problems come back to some uh, inequality, some 
some way in which uh, exploitation has occurred somewhere in the system at its heart. So at this point, I'm very interested in trying to understand the origins of these uh, of, of these inequities. Now, some of them for me, because, because I'm not quite as radical, so I don't see, I see some of these problems as instrumental, some of these inequities as instrumental and as constructed through a sort of systemic conspiracy. I mean, Joe's work, for example, on prisons and on slavery in the United States and on the convict leasing system has had a profound impact on me. He has shown that slavery has, has, has continued through other forms of governance in both the public and private sector, even after the civil war in the United States, my home country. And, and, and so there are inequities that are generated through constructed processes. And I have to, I can't help but also just to mention that the current administration in the United States seems to be pursuing the same agenda with regard to immigration. It's, it's, it's and, other top, and other areas as well. But I also believe that there are some ways in which uh, these uh, inequities arise from uh, uh, from uh, fr from uh, uh, the distributions of risks and uncertainties and ambiguities in ways that our theories don't adequately consider. So, for example, uh, in our financial system, we're all encouraged, you know, to diversify, you know, in our pension strategies and our strategies for retirement. That distribution of risk leads to the allocation of funds in ways that, and, and a conceptualization of risk and return that is, in my view, compli complicit in the inequities that give rise to the global challenges. And I, I, you could argue that's conspiratorial, but I think also it is passively accepted without uh, being fully understood. So there's a lot of work to do, I think, to reconceptualize risk, uncertainty, ambiguity in our field and not just rely on exogenous Knightian conceptualizations of uncertainty as uh, foundational to these kinds of inequities. The second piece I think it, it arises, it relates to, um, to inadequate or poor or outdated governance. And again, here I've been trying to work in this domain again with many friends on the on, on the call. You know, uh, Aline Gatignon, Leo, and I have been working on a PDW proposal for next year's academy, in which we want to talk about stakeholder governance and the ways in which uh, risk uh, risk can be managed differently through effective governance. And of course, again, the work that I've done with Joe, Peter, and Christos has been very much about adaptive governance. This is sort of uh, entrepreneurialism to try to construct new governance arrangements. I've also been incredibly fortunate to be part of the MacArthur Network on uh, opening governance with Beth Novick at NYU for the last, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years. Now, uh, Beth, now a dear friend and a political scientist and lawyer who's actually trying to implement this in uh, practice. And I'm very fortunate uh, to be part of that. The third piece, so the first piece is reconceptualizing, reconceptualizing uncertainty risk and uh, ambiguity. The second is on super organizational governance and adaptive governance to try to manage risk and prevent these kinds of problems from occurring more effectively. And then the third is uh, that translation and that entrepreneurial translation between, uh, between a knowledge generation or scientific knowledge and, uh, uh, and, and practical uh, activity that, uh, that, that instantiates that knowledge you know, in governance forms without risk that disproportionately affects the poor. I mean, you know, think for example of the development of new COVID vaccines where the challenge uh, trials are going to be administered primarily to poor people who get paid for that. So if, if a challenge trial were to come into my community, I'm not sure I would sign up. I'm too old, I'm 60 years old this year. I'm too old and I don't need the money. But my next door neighbor who just got thrown out of work and doesn't have a job and sees a chance to make 500 bucks might say yes. So that's an example of, of the allocation of risk associated with the commercialization of a scientific innovation that gets disproportionately allocated to someone who's vulnerable. And that, that, that translational process of science into impact, we need to study that better in the field of entrepreneurship, knowledge, and innovation to prevent the kinds of outcomes that are unacceptable to us. Thank you. Thank you. It was very, very uh, interesting. Um, 
talking about um, global health then, I mean, that's been one of your main interests about, among the different um, uh, grand, grand challenges. Um, but the question is, we are interested in, in, in pursuing these kind of big questions. Okay, but we are coming, let's say, at least most of us from some maybe, maybe different backgrounds, okay? So, if, and taking your example, you were coming from a background which maybe was not that close to the domain of global health. Um, and the question is, how can we make this jump? What kind of knowledge do we need if we want to try to, to, to tackle this problem as a researcher? Or how do we build it? And is it possible to transfer some of our, uh, our knowledge? And, and then at the end of the day, the crucial question is, how much is easy to actually publish in, in this domain? Right, sure. So, Giacomo, it's so wonderful to talk with you, and I'm so grateful for your interest in this question and, and for your friendship in asking, uh, asking about uh, this problem. So, so, let me see if I can answer more succinctly than I answered the last question. So, you know how we talked before about the big picture and then the pieces of the puzzle? I think junior scholars uh, PhD students, assistant professors, really need to, um, to uh, you know, master, to demonstrate mastery over pieces of the puzzle in order to be able to be permanently installed in the profession, okay? Now, uh, that, that means that post-tenure, um, a transition, there's an invitation to a, to a transition. And, you know, you can start that transition pre-tenure and you can of course uh, continue to publish a very specialized papers post-tenure, but overall the arc of opportunity for scholars over the course of a career will tend to move from the specialized to the broad overall, okay? Um, one, uh, you know, I, I, I've got um, my undergraduate uh, roommate at Northwestern University, Joyce Chaplin, is an eminent historian who uh, is uh, at Harvard, and she's a, an American Studies scholar. And um, you know, we we often we often joke, or, or or when we get together and have dinner or whatever, we often say that if we had known when we were young how things would have turned out when we were older, we would have been so much happier back then at the beginning. Um, you know, this, the, many people, not Joyce, but, it, but many people who, when they get more senior, don't fully embrace the opportunity to broaden because it, they've spent so many years mastering a set of specialized skills that they, it, that, that, and they need a break. So they tend to continue to do what they know until, um, you know, much later when they make a very severe break and then sometimes go write a book or even stop doing research altogether and, uh, you know, pursue other interests uh, that are outside academics. So, so for me, the invitation is to everyone, uh, you know, I know in our profession who is newly tenured is to step back and say, okay, what was that big picture that motivated me to go into the PhD program in the first place? What is the thing that I've been trying to uh, sort of work on over time? What, what are my findings tending to generate in terms of insight about uh, important problems that I really feel are worth my life's work, my attention, my, and where I can make a commitment? And then to talk about what the big picture is without reservation, without worrying about having to dot every I and cross every T. It is okay as an academic to say, I believe that this is what's going on, but I, I don't have every single detail right, but this is my best understanding. And of course, we have this amazing example of Dr. Fauci right now who, has, who is doing that. He, he is out there saying, I don't know exactly when, he, I was wrong. He originally said that the vaccine was gonna be available in September. And now he's saying maybe around the end of the year, he was wrong about that, but he was right about washing hands and wearing masks, you know? And it, it, he's, he's out there saying, you know, here's what I know here's my best shot, and then he's taking punches, you know? But you know what? When you are tenured and you are senior and you have been studying something for a long time, 
it is, in my opinion, your obligation to everyone who invested in you over the course of your life and to every future scholar that seeks to build knowledge that's based on your shoulders, you know, to actually say what you think is true and take the risk of potentially being wrong in some marginal sense, but still setting that platform and making that translation for society. So that's, for me, I've always been interested in healthcare. I've always been interested in the distribution of risk. I've always been interested in fairness. I've always been interested in wellness. And for me, the transition to Grand Challenges was again, a return to my core as opposed to, uh, you know, a change, a left turn or something in my identity uh, that occurred uh, when I when I got tenure. <laughs> Thank you. I'm afraid, Giacomo, you're going to be sorry you asked me these questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much. It's been it's been very very stimulating this this conversation. I mean, I want to close this uh, this topic um, on uh, talking a little bit about the role of business schools in in our uh, in our society, in the sense that um, not uh, not just as a research institute, but also as teacher. Um, so, I mean. How will you evaluate the role of business school in the past 10 years since you wrote that statement? And what did they do good and what did they miss so far in, in a way that could have contributed to the society? So back in 2010, when I criticized business schools, I was criticizing the shareholder-oriented, finance-oriented view, and really the culture of business education in which I grew up, which was um, one that uh, privileged, um, you know, privilege the privileged it was it was it was a very elitist kind of conceptualization of networking of how people make progress very different from the kind of networking that we do in the academy which is uh, around ideas that was networking around status and networking around you know people that could help you be make more money and be more successful one of my uh, really close friends from business school rich carson was having coffee with not too long ago and you know we were saying well the, the, the impact that we made over the course of our lives was so different than what we thought we would, the impact that we, we, we thought, I mean, Rich was saying, we thought we would have much more money than we were being taught we would have when we were in business school. Our real impact has not been to do that. Our real impact has been, uh, we were saying to, you know, we were part of the generation that made being LGBTQ plus be kind of mainstream. We were part of the generation that uh, really tried to connect um, the, the value capture to value creation and, and, to, and to see value creation by organizations as part of uh, our primary agenda, not just value capture. So, you know, where do I see business schools going? I think business schools have changed now. I, 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 it's been much faster than I thought it would have occurred. I think in most business schools, there is a very strong commitment to the SDGs. In fact, uh, Jim Walsh at Michigan was telling me that uh, in their performance reviews every year at Michigan, they have to put in what they've been doing to promote the SDGs as faculty members, which is amazing. Uh, such a great business school as the University of Michigan actually formalizing that into criteria for uh, evaluating their faculty members' impact. So, so I think that our journals, that our business school curricula are all... I mean, this is where COVID has a silver lining for us as business educators. Now is the moment. We have to reconstitute our classes. Let's not mail it in. Let's really think about, you know, what do you know that you want to train young people? Our generation has left your generation, Giacomo Kanye, with a lot of problems, those SDGs as a starting point. You know, what do we want to train our students to do to try to make human enterprise and prosperity sustainable? You know, it's time to step up and say what we really think in our classrooms. And I think that's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we'll leave the stage to Kenji for uh, start talking a little bit more about the COVID-19 aftermath. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Anita. Amazing conversation. And uh, our topic three today is uh, COVID-19 and the aftermath. This is a topic everyone is uh, talking about nowadays. And uh, with the shock of COVID-19, I think lots of us realized that the most urgent grand challenge today is indeed concerning the global health. And from your, your perspective, to what extent do you think the national and the international health systems 
are prepared and uh, where have been the most relevant managerial flaws here? Yeah. So, you know, in places of poverty, low and middle income countries, there are tremendous gaps in health systems for being able to even administer medicines uh, effectively. But I think we also need to recognize that in high income countries, such as Canada and the United States, where I hang around, that the structure of the medical system, not necessarily medical professionals individually, but the institutional structure of the medical system has given rise to the, has contributed to COVID. To COVID. In other words, many of our core systems have actually created this situation in which COVID can arise. You know, it's so interesting to um, listen to and watch um, interviews of Bill Gates, uh, who has been such a tremendous, um, you know, success as a business person and as a contributor to global health in our lifetimes. Um, really, uh, uh, it's hard to imagine anyone having a commensurate impact uh, on global health as Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates. Uh, but of, of course, Bill Gates also in business, you know, uh, at Microsoft over the course of his, his lifetime, a great hero of mine uh, here. And he says in his interviews, you know, where did I go wrong? I warned people about a pandemic. I warned people about the fragility of health systems in low and middle income countries. And recently he's been saying, you know, where I went wrong, it was, we really have a pretty rotten conceptualization of what even constitutes health in our uh, societies. You know, we, we, we're all about fixing broken parts. This is my language now. It's all about, um, you know, an industrial era conceptualization of our physical bodies uh, that say, you know, repair and restore to the same level of uh, pathology that led to the problem in the first place. I, I broke my arm and slipped, slipped and fell and broke my arm a couple of years ago. Fixing my broken parts was phenomenal. I am super grateful for the people that fit my arm into a cast and for the medical care that I received. But nobody talked with me about how it was a pretty dumb idea for a 50 something year old woman with low grade osteoporosis to be ice skating. Like that is not a smart idea. Now take more serious medical conditions like, um, uh, you know, uh, cardiovascular disease, cancers, which are most uh, prevalent uh, uh, causes of death in, in high income countries. They're also very prevalent in low income countries. Uh, those are, are, are caused by poor nutrition, by stress, by lifestyle choices. Um, and then uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the uh, infectious diseases, uh, malaria, uh, HIV, tuberculosis, and now COVID, uh, that are, are afflict primarily the poor. The reason that our pharmaceutical and healthcare systems didn't pursue those diseases is because administering therapies to prevent transmission of infectious diseases is not profitable. Those structural problems are management problems. They're strategy problems. They are not problems that we can foist off to others saying that's not our field. It is our field. It's more our field than it is their field. <laughs> it's more a management and strategy failure than it is a health you know, it is as much a management and strategy failure as it is a, a, a medical failure. Heroic doctors trying to administer medicines that they can't get access to, you know, that, that's a strategy and uh, uh, management failure. So look, I mean, there's only one world. There isn't a third world and a first world. There's only one world and the actions that are taken in pursuit of profit in high income countries have profound implications for the health of people in you know, remote markets in Wuhan, China. We can't think of ourselves as in you know, some sort of ivory tower where our mm -hmm. pursuit of, of, of profit in a, a limited sense is inconsequential for the evolution of the system in a broad sense. We need to think very differently about our dependent variables. <laughs> yeah. Thank. You. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Now I th thank you for revealing so many flaws. Uh, and uh, now we saw many flaws were revealed by this pandemic. Maybe we need to talk a bit about innovation to solve these flaws. And uh, how should the health system do you think uh, to adapt or innovate facing this situation? And uh, how can we, like as management scholars, contribute to the current situation? 
Well, we need to, not just in healthcare, but in general in society, yeah. think about, well, what is wellness? And, you know, we have to think about how much do we want to consume? You know, do we really, you know, there, there's a, a very um, profound conversation that's been ongoing about artificial intelligence, about the addictiveness of these devices, about, um, about uh, the, the ownership of identity oriented privacy information by large companies. Um, it, it's time for us for a whole range of reasons, including the pandemic, but also including all the other stuff under the SDGs to really think about well, what do we want to organize for? You know, uh, organizations are tools for people working together to get stuff done under certain governance arrangements that distribute risk. So instead of pursuing the longevity of organizations or pursuing their profitability, why don't we step back and say, what are the foundations of value creation in this century? What do we want to do in terms of wellness? What do we want to do in terms of, you know, social interaction and relationship building? I'll tell you, Giovanni Valentini, if he called me and asked me to do something, I would do it. I, my commitment to him as my friend in my life is enduring. It, it doesn't matter what he does. He is my friend, you know? What does that mean? Does Facebook own that knowledge or do I? Or does he, how do we enrich that experience using these tools without giving up so much information about our private vulnerabilities that we can be exploited? This new Netflix series on social dilemma has a picture in there of a 12 year old girl being subtly uh, told that her ears are too small and a tear comes down her cheek. She's incredibly insecure. She's 12 years old because of her development. She's very vulnerable to that. That just angers me. I don't want her vulnerability to be exploited by a for-profit company just as I don't want my friendship with Giovanni Valentini to be exploited by a for-profit company. I want the technology, I want the medicines, I want the choices that we make to create uh, an organization between us, an organization uh, across not just us, but our scholarly friends, the, uh, the institutions through which we teach, the companies that we seek to influence. I want organizations to be aligned with the achievement of truly valuable, uh, sustainable, humane, uh, humanitarian outcomes that, uh, that will lead to high quality of life and prosperity and actualization over time. I really don't care about profits of companies. I really don't. I think profits of companies are an artifact of their contribution uh, to something important. And we need, to, we need to get aligned much more broadly with the whole purpose of organizations in society as opposed to advancing organizational profitability, um, you know, unconstrained by uh, the implications. Thank you. Yeah, I strongly agree. Indeed, I think like facing this 21st century and the climate change things, we do need to equip with a very uh, sustainable mm -hmm. and humanitarian view. And uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And uh, let's now move to topic four and I will leave the floor for Jacob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Anita. And uh, so let's Let's close our discussion before moving to uh, some Q&A. We're already seeing we have some, some question coming in the chat from the audience. Uh, and let's have your opinion on what's next. In a sense, okay, we, we talk about many interesting things now. Um, and what's next for now for both companies? So how can they really play a role in, uh, in, in, in tackling societal problems? And what's next for us as strategy and, and innovation scholars? Where the field should move uh, now? So, um, um, you know, there's a lot of diversity in the field of companies and, of course, diversity in the field of scholars. And, um, you know, the advice, it's always a painful and dangerous thing to give advice to people, you know. Um, um, you, you, you know, it, 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 it's a very private thing, you know, I, I want, because whatever someone needs in order to be able to be unlocked from some constraint and to be able to pursue their, their core um, sort of uh, uh, impact, their core, their core ability to actualize is gonna be so personal and so reflective of where they are in their lives and what they need. Uh, it, it, so 
I always want to, whenever I engage in, in a conversation with someone about the future, want to do that with compassion and empathy that's aligned with that person's individual circumstances here. I feel more comfortable talking. So let me pick out someone. So I, I see the wonderful Aline Gatignon uh, has written in the chat, and I mentioned her a little bit earlier here. Uh, Aline is an assistant professor uh, at uh, at uh, Wharton, who was trained at INSEAD. I hope I have that right, Elaine. Please correct me in the chat if I'm if I'm wrong um, here. And she, and she, you know she's really interested in stakeholder governance and has done this amazing work on companies like Natura, for example, that have been uh, pioneers in uh, try in pursuing actualization. It's a very uh, uh, Natura is a Brazilian cosmetics company that has orient itself not only around environmental sustainability and sourcing its ingredients from the Amazon. And I've learned a lot about this from Aline, but also from Leo, who has um, uh, written about Natura and we're working on a paper on Natura. Um, you know, but also uh, it, it, Natura has aligned itself with supporting its, its sales reps. Now, the sales reps model that it pursues, I'm a little bit worried about because it's, it, it, it's a, like an Avon lady kind of model where there's the potential for a Ponzi scheme. Okay, but at the same time, there's also a commitment to the representative's education and, and so on. So how, you know, how does a company like that create opportunities? I mean, Tomas uh, here and I have been working on a paper with some friends from Brazil on general education for people who are in roles like this. How, how does a company's investment in the general education of women in these kinds of roles support their development and naturalization. So there, there's always, there are always risks. And the way those risks are managed and allocated, I think is something that I wanna know more about. I don't feel like I could advise comprehensively on that, but for me, that's the agenda, you know, is to understand um, th those issues. For young scholars like you, Giacomo, I don't know you very well. I, I uh, Kangi, I hope I get to know you better over time, but I would say, you know, as a first step, really thinking about why did you pursue this pr profession? What is it that is motivating you to want to be a professor? Where do you think the potential for your own impact is greatest? And not be, you know, n n not under uh, invest in that exercise of really trying to think about what am I doing here? What am I doing with these best years of my life? Certainly not preparing to be hazed constantly uh, by reviewers, you know, uh, <laughs> but how am I going to make sure that I'm working on problems that really reflect my, my core interests and core capabilities? I think if we each do that, and if we bring our best selves to the classroom, never mailing it in, always trying our best to, you know, teach what we know and to support our students, that the profession will follow, you know, uh, Organizations follow people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it has been an, an amazing, an amazing conversation. Um, we have, we still have five minutes to, to, to answer, I mean, some of the questions from the audience. We already have uh, a couple of questions in the chat. I will go read them in order as they arrive. Um, and then maybe if any other want to jump in, if we still have time. Um, so the first, um, Victor uh, asked this, so we already talked about a little bit the, uh, how PhD student can, um, uh, let's say, jump into uh, this um, very important um, domain. So he asked, um, what piece of advice would you give to PhD student in peripheral countries that want to contribute to an agenda, an agenda pursuing to answer a big question? Why still having to stick to the academic job market specific requirements in order to pursue a successful international career? So for me, there's no such thing as a peripheral country. The future is in countries that have not been previously served by business schools effectively or at scale, but there's no such thing as a peripheral country. So, so uh, you know, Victor, uh, uh, please have confidence that what you're doing is incredibly important to the future of the field and important to what we're doing. One of the things that's gonna be challenging for someone who's in a country where there aren't strong investments in PhD students and there isn't a highly developed academic enterprise is in getting trained in publishing. In other words, in, in, in 
writing deep and and uh, you know theoretically and empirically aligned um, papers that will pass through successfully through the uh, through the uh, publication process. So I would suggest Victor to uh, try to pursue not just at the SMS but also through other avenues such as at the academy and elsewhere um, opportunities to get training in the publication process uh, here. But uh, there's no way that what you're doing is is anything less than uh, incredibly important. Uh, the, the, the issue is getting from that big picture to be trained to actually contribute, you know, uh, uh, pieces of the puzzle that are so well executed that uh, we think for years that that piece of the puzzle is the anchor for the whole big picture. So learning how to publish effectively and being trained in the theory and the empirics is, is the only challenge. Thank you. We have uh, another question here from the chat from Aline who was asking, what would you say to academics in other fields, such as education, epidemiology, who have been expressing frustration about other fields, such as economics and presumably management, weighing in on the pandemic response? I think, I mean, thank you for the question. Um, for me, the reason that I'm cross-appointed to the medical school and the Dalalana School of Public Health, and not to mention the Massachusetts General Hospitals, the Division of Global Health Innovation, is because I have spent as much time as my colleagues could tolerate showing up and talking with people about these problems. It is, I've had an unbelievable set of experiences just showing up, for example, at seminars in the School of Public Health. I, I show up at seminars that are public seminars that are being offered in epidemiology in the School of Public Health, listening to what people are doing. And then I show up as a management scholar and people are so shocked that someone from strategy or from management would show up at a public health a seminar. If you do it a few times, they invite you to lunch or something or you know, uh, invite you to have a, a chat on Zoom. And then pretty soon you're actually learning as much as you're, as you're disseminating in terms of understanding. So for me, like I said, it's, it's, it's listening, listening to learn and really actually interacting you know, the, actually interacting with other people and trying to develop mutual learning. It's something that computers are not very good at doing and we're great at doing. So, uh, you know, making friends, connecting, contributing, helping, um, you know, saying yes when people that ask you to do things that are in sister disciplines that are, not, are, are structurally siloed, but where there's a potential opportunity for kind of synergistic interaction you know, overcoming this, the, the structural barriers and, 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 and interacting. That, that's, that's what I've tried to do. Thank you. Um, I think we are, um, we are perfect on time. And if there is any other question, we, we probably have just one more minute. Uh, just one, one last question, just arrive. Uh, let's, uh, the challenge is to transition from being immersed to the phenomenon in question to transcend it into the theory behind. What action do you recommend? This is a question from Jay's, uh, which is talking about, I've been in executive corporate space for the past 50, 25 years, and now I'm transitioning to academia and doing my PhD in strategy. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, Jay, my advice is the same that I th gave. It's, it's harder for us who have had some executive experience in 25 years, amazing, but big picture, find something small, linchpin to the whole picture, and just nail that theoretically and empirically. Okay, thank you very much, Anita. Uh, thank you, thank you, Giovanni. Thank you all for being here. I think it's been a very nice conversation. Take care, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.